The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, um, social movements. I remind you of the picture we had the first day and once or twice. I should have done it more often since. But on the first day, you know, we've been talking about policy making. Uh, we, we did on Monday, we talked mainly about interest groups here, a little bit about regulatory processes. We'll come back to that uh, on Wednesday. But up here at the top is this vague sort of outside the box, uh, outside these boxes at least, category of norms and customs and values and traditions and institutions. And we had movements in there, social movements. And that, that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about what they are, how they differ from other policy actors, how they work, and briefly, what impacts can we see on energy and environmental policy. So if you think about who affects policy? They're obviously individual firms or households. And in the US setting, you have to think about, for federal policy, you have to think about sub-federal governments and occasionally tribes. What we talked about last time were all of these, this alphabet soup of interest groups that you will find on K Street in Washington, and you'll find various analogs in state capitals. Sometimes they fly in. For those who don't, live in this world, that's the National Rifle Association, the American Forest Products Association, the Environmental Defense Fund, the AFL-CIO, the union organization, the American Association of Retired People, which sends you mailings when you turn 50 to show you're really old, uh, the American Petroleum Institute, the National Coal Institute, and there are many more. Um, then there are political parties. Republican, Democrat, or Democratic, depending on which party you affiliate with. Uh, green parties are lots, in lots of places, Whig parties in US history, plenty of other parties in various places. And then social movements. So the best way I find to think about a social movement is to think about examples. So as I, as I go back to my period of consciousness, there are a number of them that come to mind. And let me just walk through a few. There's the Civil Rights Movement. That's the group gathering to hear Dr. Martin Luther King. Not all those people were paying dues to anything or had membership cards to anything, but they had all come to Washington. Most people would probably call the Civil Rights Movement successful. Maybe not. This is the anti-Vietnam War Movement. Um, that, of course, is, is at MIT. This was in 1970. The picture, and that's some other campus, and this is Washington. The picture I looked for very hard but couldn't find, and I know it exists, is a picture of the then president of MIT, Howard Johnson, marching uh, with a group of students down Mass Avenue with an anti-war banner. That movement you might call successful, ultimately. I'm going to come back to this. You might ask, why? Most of those people are too young to vote. So why was that movement successful? Or did the movement have anything to do with ending the war, actually? This is the environmental movement. That's an early rally. Senator Muskie in Washington. I think that's in Washington, addressing a group. And the tree hugger on the right, I couldn't resist. So. There you, you've got the, uh, the environmental movement. Successful? Maybe, maybe not. Also, you'll notice one of the interest groups I had up there was the Environmental Defense Fund. So one might want to think about where that boundary is, and we'll come back to that. The women's movement. You see there the, I think that's the entirety of the Equal Rights Amendment, for which there was also opposition. As regards the Equal Rights Amendment, you could argue that was pretty successful. Those, you don't see votes like that anymore. 
The Equal Rights Amendment phrased on the left passed the House in 1972, 354 to 24 in the Senate, 84 to 8. That means there were a lot of Republican votes for it. 30 states ratified it by the end of 1973, but it failed. They needed 38 to pass. It got 35 by 1979, never got the 30. All of these pieces of legis, all of these amendments have a deadline for ratification. The deadline here was 79, and it didn't make it. And some states rescinded ratification. And I don't think you could get that, I don't think you could get that amendment voted on in Congress now let alone passed. So you got to ask, was that movement successful? That was a movement. I mean, you got troops turning out, you got rallies, you got an anti-movement. Was that movement successful? What did it do? This is a more recent one. You may recall the meetings of the World Trade Organization, the international organization that basically sets trading rules for international trade. Um, for a period, those meetings were dangerous. I don't know whether this is the one in Seattle, but downtown Seattle got sort of trashed by people who were protesting globalization, protesting the WTO, which is a bunch of bureaucrats who deal with trade disputes um, and associated it with global injustice, uh, 1999. Um, that movement failed. I think that's fair to say. Right? We have globalized. Uh, trade has not turned back. And that movement has pretty much vanished. How come? How come some succeed and some fail? This is the anti-nuclear movement. This is international. This is a, that's Germany. Atomkraft, Nein Danke. That's Japan. And that, of course, is Vermont, where the future of the Vermont Yankee nuclear plant is much debated. Is that movement successful? That movement started, well, I'm going to come back to that movement because we'll talk about that actually at some length. But that movement is global. A lot of power plants have been built since that movement started. A lot of nuclear plants, still active. This is the anti-fracking movement more recently. That's New York, as you see. That's somewhere in Paris. And that, I believe, is Bulgaria. Uh, so it, it, like the anti-nuclear movement, is fairly broad geographically, has succeeded in some places, succeeded at least tentatively in New York and in France. I have no idea what the status is in Bulgaria. Um, the Tea Party movement, look at those numbers. Has the Tea Party movement succeeded? Will the Tea Party movement last? How does the Tea Party movement work? And of course, on the other side, by the way, that's impressive. That's Washington. Um, that's Pennsylvania Avenue full of people. Uh, this is the opposite side of the coin, the Occupy movement. Again, jobs not cuts, whereas the, <laughs> the we want less over here, and jobs not cuts over here. So you have two opposed social movements as we speak. And then most dramatically, this is a good time for this topic, most dramatically the Arab Spring. So as you go around, there's Tahrir Square in Egypt, there's Tunisia, there's Yemen, government toppled, government toppled, government toppled, Bahrain, protests continuing, uh, Syria, civil war, Libya, government toppled. Social movements. Okay, there are a lot of them. This is just one slice of history, a recent slice of history. Uh, I'm going to come back and talk about some of them. But the first thing we ought to worry about is um, how, what are these things? How, do, how are they distinct from other, other actors? Certainly, they're trying to influence policy. That's what they're there for. Not always in a coherent way, not always in a well-defined way. The anti-globalization movement 
what exactly did they want? What's the Occupy movement want? But in any case, they're trying to, not necessarily with a specific agenda, but they're trying to have some influence. This is easy. I listed these actors at the start. They're not a formal part of the process. They're not on the ballot. They're not registered. They don't, they don't have national committees and slates of candidates formally. The boundary between a social movement and an interest group, though, and Burstein talks about this, is a little blurrier, right? Um, Lowy, whom we read earlier, has this, this italicized phrase, which is sort of interesting. All established interest groups are conservative. And he means conservative not in the sense of uh, left-right, in the sense of less government, more government, but in the old-fashioned sense of less change, more change. So he means they are conservative in the sense that interest groups tend to resist radical change. They're part of the system. The American Forest Products Association has some laws it likes, has some laws it doesn't like, lobbies here, lobbies there. If you said, let's fundamentally rethink the way we do timber, they'd be appalled. Because that, that's not what they're, what they're there for. Um, OK, so that's, and they also tend to be more structured, right? The Environmental Defense Fund has members, has a budget, has offices, has lobbyists, uh, writes papers. They do routine influence. They lobby, they enter briefs in court, they send in petitions. Social movements tend to be on the margins. Tend to be on the margins of the system. Membership is not well defined. Who is a member of the civil rights movement? Who was a member of the anti-war movement, anti-Vietnam movement? Almost everybody I knew did something. None of us had cards. Um, and they tend to engage in what you'd call non-routine actions, like marches and demonstrations and chaining themselves to fences and all of that stuff. They vary resources, organization, tactics. Greenpeace is an interesting example, right? Greenpeace is noted for its anti-whaling activities, has ships, intercepts, interferes with whaling. That's a non-routine action. It also has lobbyists in various, in various capitals to push for various things. So Greenpeace sort of is an interest group in the sense of being organized and having members and dues and stuff. But it's, it also engages in non-standard tactics. So, but all of the example social movements I had tend to be without a defined membership. Who was part of the Arab Spring? Varied from day to day. Who showed up for the demonstrations? Who's part of the, the anti-Putin movement to the extent it is a movement in Russia? Who comes? Um, who was part of the anti-war movement? Who was part of the civil rights movement? So the membership tends to be unclear. The actions tend to be non-standard. The anti-Vietnam movement did engage in massive letter writing campaigns, which is pretty standard. But it also occupied the MIT president's office and various other university president's offices, which is pretty non-standard. So it's a, it's a mixture. Thoughts about this so far? OK. So how do they work when they work? How might any of these affect public policy? What are the mechanisms? Why do they matter? Why do they ever matter? What are they doing? Yeah? And sometimes it's trying to show that if a politician does something that these social movements, or back something these social movements find distasteful or unpopular, that people will be displeased with them, they're like less likely to get elected. Yeah. A recent example might be that Sofa Bill. People made it very clear that this is not something they supported, and so a politician back away from them. So one mechanism is, in a sense, they provide information, or they demonstrate salience. Salience, salience is awareness, 
So an issue is salient to me if I'm aware of it and I consider it important. So you could argue that the anti-Vietnam protests made it clear that to at least a segment of the population, all of us who could get drafted, uh, we were very aware of what was going on. It was very important to us. We felt strongly. Okay, so they can provide information about salience, about the population's feelings. How else might it work? Yeah, Brendan? Although you just voted, not necessarily motivate politicians, you also motivate, motivate other people, like, you know, so like to come on board. So you might, well, there are two ways you might do that, right? One way is to change preferences. Right? You, could, you could persuade people that, by getting them to think about it, that this group is right. You could argue that was a large part of what Martin Luther King did. Uh, and this, the effective leadership of the civil rights movement, it persuaded a lot of people that the current state of affairs was just wrong, full stop wrong. Um, it blurs with uh, raised salience. I think these two are, are hard to separate, right? Because, because it, it could be that an awful lot of people in the North were unaware of just how segregated the South was. So you made people aware of it by, by increasing awareness. That works, of course, if they agree with you. Charlotte? I think that, like, going along with the trend of getting more people involved, just having a group uh, makes people who already have that belief maybe are already aware of the issue, but just unaware of how they could affect it, like join together, and then it makes people just because there are more bodies. So this is... Yeah, yeah, the model Burstein has is that works if it makes a politician rethink, um, rethink their um, uh, prospects. And so I guess I'd, I'd sort of put that one in a way here, but you'd say it not only demonstrates to politicians that a lot of people care about, it demonstrates to a lot of other people that people care about it. And that's a lot of the story of the Arab Spring, I think, is you got a few people who were just sufficiently outraged that they would risk getting shot at. And other people said, well, I feel that way too. And if they're going to do that, maybe I should do that. Um, and at some point, you demonstrate to the regime that it, it lacks popular support. And regimes that aren't democratic tend to not have much idea how much support they have. And it's easy to exaggerate how much support you have because every time you go out in public and have a parade, people cheer. Because they, why wouldn't you cheer? Uh, the dictator's going by. So that's interesting. You can say it sort of rallies people. Um, and I think those are the most plausible ways. We've, we've got them. Um, the uh, others, Burstein looks at people who argue that, it, that these somehow persuade as in a, in a logical sense. But that's not plausible, he says, and I agree with him, that they're not gonna, you don't march in the streets to make an intellectual argument. You mark it, march in the streets to do something else. And if it isn't going to affect re-election, uh, why bother? And if it is, why is the group necessary uh, if the person knows it? You could argue that the anti-Vietnam uh, demonstrations simply made it uh, inescapable that there was widespread opposition to the war. Public opinion polls said the same thing. But marching in the streets uh, made us all feel better, of course, but um, uh, also um, uh, brought it home. The other point I, I'm making here in that second bullet is donors. I mean, gun control is an interesting example of the impact of salience and the impact of an interest group. Polls say that 70% of Americans typically, I mean, the number varies a little bit, but 70% of Americans would favor some gun control, say limits on assault weapons on campus. 70%. 
Um, you, or, or some restrictions on, on um, carrying weapons. But most people don't care much. Every police chief favors gun control. Most people don't care much. People who support the National Rifle Association who oppose gun control care a lot. And they win. Because the fact that I favor gun control is not going to cause me, in most cases, to change my vote on anything. Because that's rarely a big campaign issue. If I'm elected, I will enact. No. That's rarely a campaign issue. Um, so those of us who care a little bit don't do anything. And those who care a lot have, and have some money have control. So that's a concentrated interest, diffuse interest example of <laughs> some importance. So the other ways we talked about providing information, you could argue that's what happened in Vietnam. That's what happened in East Germany. When the, I didn't put, out, didn't put up the demonstrations that brought down the Berlin Wall, but as distinct from the Arab Spring, nobody got shot, right? That happened quickly. They talked about the Velvet Revolution in Czechoslovakia. Talked about in East, in East Germany, nothing much happened. Crowds turned out, crowds turned out. They didn't seize the government buildings. They didn't overrun the, the uh, uh, president's or prime minister's house. The government just gave up and left. So it, I think the argument here is that they provided enormous amount of information to voters that um, you have no support, you're loathed. Changing preferences. Um, this, is off, this often has to do with reframing an issue. Think about the pro-life movement, uh, which is a brilliant piece of reframing. How can you be against life? I mean, you're for choice, but what's more important, choice or life? So you could argue that reframing the issue as are you for or against life has an impact on preferences. The, the attacks on the health care legislation by, by making it Obama's legislation, as opposed to, by the way, no pre-existing condition, universal insurance, blah, 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 uh, changes how it's thought of. It's something Obama is shoving down our throats. Um, and you can argue that, this, that civil rights did that, that that was the essence of the civil rights movement. That if you saw in, in real time the, the marchers being taken down with fire hoses, it was hard not to think, that's just wrong. These people are marching. How can they, why is that right? So, and, and you don't do, King's speeches were important, but watching people peacefully protest being beaten changes your views of the people beating them and of the issue. So part of what they do, social movements, is theater that changes preferences, as well as signals, uh, signals information. You can raise, you can raise salience um, by, by making people aware of an issue, but it, it only works if they agree with you, right? I mean, think about globalization, the anti-globalization movement. So they protested globalization, they protested poor working conditions in poor countries, and they trashed Starbucks. And most people said, what? I'm sorry. I, if you're very, very sympathetic to poor people, you say, yeah, they should pay people more in poor countries. And if you're not, you say, well, they don't have to take the jobs, you know? I mean, they're not being forced to work in these factories. It's more fun than being in a village. So it. it the example, one of the optional readings, uh, C and G, I forget now what their initials are, make the point that among people who are for environmental change and who are opposed to environmental change in a survey, awareness of environmental issues was equal. Values differed. <laughs> 
So the policy implications differed. So you make people aware that there's a lot of international trade and a lot of what you buy is uh, uh, produced by people in poor countries. One response is that's really terrible and other response is well that's a market. And if people mainly think that's a market because that's what they value, making, an issue, making them more aware of an issue won't help. You could argue the same thing happens with climate change. There's been a lot of work, I wouldn't call it a movement, but an awful lot of people have spent a lot of time trying to educate people about climate change. It has not produced a groundswell, quite the contrary. And the argument is that uh, it comes up against, it's a conflict of values. Do you want to have economic growth or do you want to have environmental protection? We can both be aware of climate change and its issues, but reach very different policy conclusions. So raising salience only works, raising awareness only works if there's agreement or potential agreement or something like agreement. And the final way, and this is the borderline, I, this isn't really social movement, I think the Burstein article is nonetheless a good article. For interest groups, how do interest groups affect policy? Well, they do all this other stuff, right? The National Rifle Association does advertise, does the Environmental Defense Fund does send out mailings to people. So these people do engage in, they organize petition drives, they do all this. But interest groups work on implementation. That's inside baseball, right? So we'll talk about it in the environmental case next time when we talk about uh, what EPA did to set standards uh, a couple of times. But the Dodd-Frank law is the big current example. Right? You can read about it in the paper all the time. The law required lots of regulations. It set up some, some new entities and it required this regulation, that regulation, spell this out, make this clear, hundreds, thousands of regulations required. No votes in Congress. Really, really boring stuff. Who wins? The people who have offices in Washington, who have lawyers, who have staff, who have resources. It's not a matter of buying votes in regulatory agencies, it's a matter of providing information, lobbying, per the piece we had assigned for last time. When the issue has low salience to the public, interchange fees on debit cards, I will tell you exercise the entire banking industry, and it may have been in the globe twice on the third business page. Every banker in the country was up in arms. Um, the Federal Reserve was required to, to regulate that. It had enormous discretion. It, it was required to regulate that fee paying due attention to incremental costs. Incremental costs varied all over the lot. Hundreds of submissions went into the Federal Reserve. They made a decision, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so that's the Durbin Amendment, right? Of the, of the Durbin, Durbin Amendment, yep. So when that, so when that was approved, uh, the fact that, uh, for example, Bank of America started charging a monthly fee for people when they use their debit card to kind of try to offset the fact that they couldn't make as much money from like the, um, from like the marginal, call, like the marginal revenue that they had before. Yep. But, wouldn't that cause people to care a lot? Because at the end of the day, the regular consumer is the one who kind of got screwed over a little bit, and the merchants are the ones who won. Um, but so wouldn't eventually like people be against the dot frame? Well, you mean against that amendment? Yeah, yeah. Well, well, I mean, here's here's here are the it was, this this was a, a fight in which I, I participated. Um, Here's sort of what happens in the short run. What happens in the short run is merchants save a little bit on debit card transactions. Not enough to cause them to cut prices because it's only a little bit. So 
one person, one, one uh, large chain said on a conference call, it was Home Depot, said on a conference call that that was worth about $100 million to them, uh, short run profits. So prices don't go down. What happens to banks is checking accounts are now less profitable. So they look to recoup in other ways. They tried the, the monthly fee. That didn't work. The easiest thing to do and what they've done quietly is they've raised the minimum balances required for free checking. So, and we'll see the numbers, but checking because of these fees, if you use the debit card a lot, the bank is, you are profitable to the bank even if you don't leave a lot of money on deposit. Take away those fees, you're no longer profitable. So they start raising the minimum requirement for free checking and the number of people without checking accounts goes up. So, I mean, that's the predictable consequence of, of the amendment. Uh, it was pushed by merchants, um, and um, <laughs> Senator Durbin talked about his friend, I think it was a hardware store owner, or a drug store owner, who was uh, being, being taken to the cleaners by these fees, so he's presumably happy. In the long run, costs get passed through. It's just their frictions to changing prices, so in the short run, they don't. Um, in the long run, prices adjust up. People pay s slightly more if they use, use cash. Um, so, it, it, but this is a, this is a typical, this is, a, this is an extreme piece of legislation. It, it was not debated, really. You got a floor vote, a quick floor vote. Um, not much material on it uh, anywhere. It said to the Federal Reserve, neglect the fixed costs of running these programs when you set a price. Wait, what? <laughs> they have to cover the fixed cost. Okay, neglect the fixed costs. And it, it instructed the Fed to consider marginal costs. The Fed ran a survey. Marginal costs varied by roughly an order of magnitude across banks. Okay, now what do you do? <laughs> and and they, they came out with a proposed rule. There was the expected howling. They uh, uh, doubled the ceiling, there was less howling, life goes on. But yeah, it'll have the effect of, re of increasing the number of unbanked people. It's not as serious as it used to be not to have a bank account, but it's still pretty serious. So yeah, the Durban Amendment, you follow this stuff, that's amazing. It's not even energy. Uh, anything else while I pause for breath and anecdote? Yeah. Could you tell us a little bit about the role that social media has played, like how to mobilize all these different publics? Like I can see with Occupy Wall Street and like, Occupy Everything, <laughs> um, how, how people have come together. I saw that, but, but something like the Civil Rights Movement. But it's like a little less clear, isn't it? How uh, The Occupy Movement I find mysterious. Because the Civil Rights Movement had a set of charismatic leaders, it had some clear objectives, and it had great media coverage, right? I mean, when those kids went to, where was it? that the civil rights workers got shot. Uh, Selma, maybe? Boy, that coverage of three college students go down to help the black community organize in Selma, Alabama and get shot for their troubles. That woke people up in an amazing way. And, and when you watch them fire hose the marchers, that was galvanizing. And when Dr. Martin Luther King spoke, that was, oh, gee, there is something here. Occupy was mysterious. Occupy just happened. I, I don't know. I don't know. These things, and the anti-globalization, similarly. What was, what was the, I can point to triggering events, right? You go back to the uh, Rosa Parks refusing to sit in the back of the bus. People s s moving into integrated lunch counters. All of this getting media attention. I can see the triggering events in civil rights were clear. The triggering event in Vietnam was pretty clear. It just went on and on. And uh, thinking about thousands of people chanting, hey, hey, LBJ, how many kids did you kill today? Um, those are pretty dramatic things, but Occupy. I don't know what triggered Occupy. Uh, I also don't know what triggered the anti-globalization movement. We know the Arab Spring, we know it was the Normally there's something. Normally so. The guy in Tunisia who, who burned himself to death in protest. We're not about just trigger, but like how people are mobilized and come together. Well, now, you, now people 
point to, particularly in the case of Egypt, it was much discussed, uh, social media. You can organize through, through Twitter and Facebook and various other connections and just things going viral in a variety of ways through people's personal networks. You can organize. Vietnam was posters. There will be a rally today. So there was a leader that called it all. Uh, there were people who appointed themselves leaders. You put up a poster and you say there's going to be a demonstration today in Killian. Well, it was then the Great Court. Um, nobody had to show up. If people weren't sort of ready to do something, you know, you can imagine calling a rally and nobody comes. That happens often enough. Um, uh, it, it, this, as far as I know, and undoubtedly there's, there's uh, people have written boring papers on it, but it strikes me just as an observer of history that it's a bit mysterious what does it. It's a bit mysterious. So, guy burns himself to death in Tunisia. Why does that spread? What triggers that? Did somebody in Egypt set himself up or herself up as a leader and begin saying, hey, we're going to meet in the square tomorrow? And then gradually it built. It did build uh, from a relatively small group. Um, but in Moscow, there are protests that have lost, have plainly lost. There are anti-Putin protests in Russia. They were small. I don't know how they happened. They weren't sufficient. They dissipated. So it doesn't always happen. Doesn't always happen, Andrew. Um, just as uh, it might be an extreme, but uh, could someone argue that, uh, like especially in say for the Arab Spring movements, uh, that violence or like the threat of violence or blackmail or the threat of uh, just like physically destroying something is a means of of, uh, of effective public policy? So not not votes, just the fact that. Uh, there's a big body out there that uh, will affect the way the country is run. So, like, let's let's meet their demands. Well, a standard a standard thing that happens, although in France it tends to be well organized, mass strikes. You can call it, you call a general strike. And if the general strike's effective, you've demonstrated that you have the that, you, that enough you've demonstrated that enough people care enough about the issue to do something. I don't know if it has to be physical violence, but I think it has to be an action because that's how you demonstrate that you care, right? I mean, now, of course, you just send an email to Congress. No, that doesn't really say that you're very excited about the issue. Uh, if you go out in March, you stand in the hot sun for a few hours, it demonstrates it. Um, the story of the civil rights movement is kind of the reverse, right? There was no threat of violence from the activists. It was the violence from those acting against them that really built support. It was Dr. King's nonviolence strategy, which worked beyond anything I've seen. Um, in Viet the Viet anti Vietnam people were pretty nonviolent too. I don't think it mattered much. Um, Occupy has been nonviolent. The Tea Party has been a little shrill, but nonviolent. Tea parties had some effect politically in the Republican Party. The Occupy movement seems to have vanished in the night. So it's a little bit mysterious. Because you mentioned strikes, because uh, one other, like, where would that category get into the fact that, so say uh, some people say, I don't know, like, uh, tomorrow all bus drivers decide they want to strike. So, like, uh, for some reason, actually, that's more pertinent in Europe, where transportation is, but because yeah. I've seen it happen. So but uh, those, are, those tend to be very heavily union. That's why I talked about a general strike. Yeah. So, so uh, I was uh, going to say even for a union, uh, so because it's a small, relatively small body, but because it, it exhibits a big, uh, like a lot of power, and like the fact that we won't have buses or the subway tomorrow will, will uh, uh, um, uh, bother a lot of, uh, a bigger majority of people w and basically that's almost like blackmail so like you're yeah. you're influencing what the majority of people is thinking about this issue it's not that 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 it's directly influencing what you're asking for which could be wages for bus drivers but they're so frustrated that we don't have buses so okay let's give them the wages because they're causing all this but problem. it can fail it could fail there was a uh, i was reading recently a fictionalized treatment of the famous police strike in boston in 1919 
that strike, police hadn't been paid, they were underpaid, hadn't gotten a raise in 30 years kind of thing. Uh, badly underpaid, they struck, there was a crime wave. The police completely lost the popular sympathy and uh, lots of them were fired and jailed and all kinds of things. So, you know, that was a threat. They carried out the threat. People got very, very angry. Uh, made Calvin Coolidge president because of how drastically he, he uh, uh, reacted against the strike. So, um, it, it, it doesn't, it's not necessarily a winning strategy. It's not necessarily a winning strategy. Um, another hand, yeah. I'm kind of confused about the difference between the first and the second strategies. The first, yeah, I must say, reading the, reading the paper, I was a little confused about his argument, too. He said, well, can you just walk in and say, um, I'm opposed to the Vietnam War. I've got, uh, there are a bunch of us, and here are my arguments. And I think what he's saying is, that's not going to work. Social movements work by demonstrating that it matters to enough people that you have to take it into account. That, and if, it, if, the, if the policymaker knows that it matters enough to a lot of people, you don't need a social movement. And if it doesn't, occupy. If it doesn't, the movement won't have any effect. I think that's what he's saying. Uh, in my money, for so, in social movements, what you want to think about is to think about these three. Are you, are you persuading people that a lot of people care? Are you, are you making changing people's preferences toward an issue, or are you making them more aware of an issue and, and making it more important? You could be aware of fracking. You could make it more important in people's, in people's minds by providing information. You could raise salience either by awareness or on the important side. Um, and this is an inside baseball story. So I share, I share your confusion about the first. I confess I read his argument on the first one, and I said, well, what would that look like? Uh, the, the closest thing I can, I can think of is maybe in Vietnam uh, th there was some persuasion, but I think what Vietnam was all about was this, was letting people know that a large part of the population was passionate. And that's what happened in, in Czechoslovakia and East Germany and generally throughout Eastern Europe. Um, once it became clear the Russians weren't going to intervene militarily, and it became clear to the government that they had no popular support, game over. Game over, yeah. I'm not sure if I'm correct, but my theory, my overall theory for like the Occupy uh, movement is that it wasn't necessarily tricked by any particular event. However, there was, like since the financial crisis and then all the economic problems that were happening in the country, I think there were just a lot of people unsatisfied in the current status. But I don't think that would, <clears throat> that would have been enough to trigger the movement. And for this particular case, I think the actual people, the initial leaders who, who try to convince people, those are really the key players. I don't think that's something that, would have, that was bound to happen regardless of whether or not someone had, had started. I don't think it would have been something that, if it didn't happen then, it would have happened two months after. I just think that the people who initially organized it did a really good job at kind of appealing to this sort of like, anar like anarchy concept of, you know, they had all those masks, uh, of that movie, V, uh, v for Vendetta, and they, you know, they well, tried to that, that, that image, and they were just like very secretive about how they attracted people, and they became viral. And it became viral, but, but what's interesting is you point to the, the particular leaders. I mean, they occupied Portland, Oregon, for heaven's sakes. What, what was that about? This was a protest against global capitalism? Have you been to Portland, Oregon? I mean, <laughs> this, is not, this is not the financial hub of the Western world with jillions of people getting rich on the backs of the masses, right? It's a pretty mellow place, but they occupied Portland. So, I, <laughs> you know, they occupied a lot of places. Uh, I give up. Let me move on. Yeah, Jillian? Oh, oh, if you're moving on. Uh, I, I was going to try, but undoubtedly it's profound. Give it a, give it a, give it a shot. I mean, I think but like he said, it's kind of the precipitation of like a general sentiment that the government isn't necessarily benefiting the great majority of the population. And I feel like Which is exactly what the Tea Party people thought too. Which is interesting. I don't know, I mean that's it. There's something wrong in Washington, something wrong yeah. with a different diagnosis.
very different ideas in the Tea Party movement, but it, it's just a general precipitation of something's wrong and we don't necessarily like it from a financial standpoint. I feel like the grand majority of people that took place in the movement don't necessarily know what is wrong or exactly how to fix it to begin with. So I think that's one of the reasons why it kind of died out is that it just became a general shout of I'm angry. Yeah. And n nothing. And you saw a lot of movements of the I'm angry variety during the Great Depression uh, from both left and right. So it does, you do get this in hard times. Um, uh, there was a I think sometime in the 30s there was a, uh, a World War I veterans march on Washington because pensions weren't adequate. And you got the rise of both extreme left and extreme right political groups on the grounds that it's just not right. The Tea Party movement has more heft because it actually has clear, clearer objectives. Right? There, there's a caucus in Congress. There are relatively organized groups in some congressional districts. Uh, Tea Party backing is a big deal. They have a convention. So they, they've made themselves into an interest group from a movement, interestingly enough, uh, with a little incoherence. There was, a, there was a split between the Boston Tea Party and the Worcester Tea Party recently. Uh, so they had separate, separate rallies. The Worcester Tea Party said, we're all about low taxes and limited government and stuff like that. And the Boston Tea Party said, yeah, and we hate gay marriage, too. And the Worcester people said, no, maybe we ought to just stay focused. So they split. Anyway, um, OK. To get a little closer to this course and a little less abstract, um, there's an interesting, the other assigned paper is Unseam and Salt, which is about nuclear power. Uh, and they sort of trace the partial evolution of the politics here. Uh, what did the politics of nuclear power look like in the 50s and 60s? Movements, interest groups, what? <coughs> that was a hand? Yeah. No, I was not waving. Oh, OK. Yeah. Brendan, you got it. OK. Um, I think it was kind of like, let's do this. Like, this is going to be like, it's going to cost like pennies to like, it's going to cost you pennies. Like Too cheap to meter was yeah, the phrase. Too cheap, cheap to meter. It was very and the politics was industry interest groups, right? There was the, uh, the, the paper labeled a bunch of them. Um, the big thing, their big win was there's a limit still in force on the liability uh, of any uh, related to any nuclear facility. The Atomic Energy Commission was regulatory, but it was also pro it also was promoting atomic energy as well as regulating. So it was like the early years of uh, air airline travel, where you know it, it, what politics there was was positive. Industry groups dominated. Inside the Beltway stuff, not much in the media except for cheap, swell, good, clean, etc. What happened in the 70s? Yeah. It was a combination of a movie called The China Syndrome that came out, then Three Mile Island. Like China Syndrome might have been a little later, but go ahead, not much later. There was some, well, it was it like followed Three Mile Island a little bit. Like, oh, yeah. It's kind of frightening. And then Three Mile Island happened, which kind of seemed to mimic the movie. But like, oh, geez, this is reality. It's actually dangerous. And you began to get a different kind of politics, right? Politically, what did you get? I showed you. What was, on, what was on that slide? You got an anti-nuclear movement. You got people marching. You got protests. All of a sudden, you had these industry groups in Washington with guys in suits, and other capitals, for that matter. It wasn't just an American phenomenon. And then you began to have those German marchers and the Japanese marchers and Vermont is recent, but you had American marchers, you began to get an anti-nuclear movement with protests. And after Three Mile Island, the industry stopped. Now this is the neat part, which I actually wasn't aware of until I saw the article. What did the industry try to do to react to this? Do you have the guys in suits in Washington? Are they a good reaction? Yeah. 
They tried to do a pro-nuclear movement. Did, the, did it work? How come? Um, well, the article mentions like the, the anti-nuclear movement came like from the people and they all felt like, like the, the art. And the industry back to movement where people in suits so that were like set apart from the, the masses and then it just really didn't take hold of it. So they tried to do it, but, but they really had trouble making it authentic. The, the anti-nuclear movement was mom and pop and your uncle and people really upset, and the pro-nuclear movement was kind of industry people with their ties off. The, the phrase they use in the business is to distinguish between grassroots and astroturf. Uh, Grassroots movements are really genuine and reflect popular sentiment. AstroTurf is created, right? You can see it when you, get, when you get emails, when a congressional office gets emails on an issue and they're all identical. You say, oh, that's AstroTurf. Somebody is, is really pushing people to send. Somebody is saying to all their employees, send this email. Um, that's not people being passionate. And it just didn't work. Didn't work. It was an attempt to create a movement to affect energy policy. Didn't work. There are not a lot of social movements in energy directly. You see them more on the environmental side. And the piece by Rooked, uh, but environmental movements affect energy, so it's worth talking about. That's a depressing article if you, if you read the first part in a bad mood because he says the environment's gotten worse and species are getting extinct and we're, de we're depleting natural resources. I would just argue that he's measuring against the past, not against what would have happened but for the environmental movement since the air and the water in U.S. and Europe and many other places has improved notably. Nobody believes that, but uh, those are the numbers. Um, he argues, so he's trying to be quantitative. He says that um, an environmental movement can work through lobbying, can work through public opinion, can work through individual, uh, individual attitudes, or through a green party, as exists in some countries. And the reason he does this, rather than thinking about the ways we just finished talking about, the more general ways, is he's got measures of all these things. He's got measures of how big the, the green movement is. He's got measures of public opinion. He's got measures of attitudes of various kinds. And he certainly knows whether there's a green party that gets any votes. So he can measure these channels. And he gives you this nice, this nice picture. So environmental movements uh, react to environmental problems. I think interpreted largely via sciences is a little too optimistic, but perceived problems, they can lobby, they can be an interest group. The Environmental Defense Fund, the Natural Resources um, Defense Council, the Friends of the Earth, the Sierra Club, the, um, there are more, I'm trying to think of a few, but uh, they lobby as well as, as do other things. Um, uh, and so here are his channels. So he has this very interesting um, table. Based on a set of measures, he looks at the strength of environmental pressure, uh, pressure groups. He looks, based on opinion polls, attitudes toward the environment. Is there a green party? And how, how strong is the policy and what's happened to the environment? Uh, it's sort of interesting, right? The US scores high in terms of the environmental pressure group. Uh, we're kind of in the middle in terms of attitudes. We don't have a Green Party. A lot of places don't have Green Parties. And we're kind of in the middle on policy efforts, which I think is, compared to these countries, I think is not not far off the mark, roughly. Uh, and we're kind of in the middle in terms of environmental quality. I forget how he measures that. That's a, that's a tough one because he's got so many different things. But this is the, the summary, his summary of, of how these work. And I, I must say, 
So what he did was, to be clear, um, the U.S. gets a 3 here, it gets a 2 here, it gets a 1 here, it gets a 1 there, and, and a 1, or sorry, a 2 there and a 2 there. This is 3, this is 2, this is 1. And then he looks at correlations, which is not obviously the right way to do it. It's not obviously the wrong way to do it. But here they are. Okay, so reading across, an environmental pressure group is most strongly associated with the strength of policy across countries. It has very little to do with whether there's a Green Party or not, the stars or statistical significance. Very little to do with whether there's a Green Party or not. Why don't we have a Green Party in the United States? Brendan. Uh, is that what he called it? Okay. We might have once. We don't have one now. They do in Germany. Various other countries do. Well, Julian? I would say we have one. It's just insignificant. It's what? It's just insignificant. Insignificant. Yeah, well, that, maybe that's it. Why don't we have one that's significant? Well, we've always been heavily polarized in the party <coughs> system. But Democrats or Republicans, it's really hard for any party to break into that and make it a free party system, but especially a green movement, which is sort of like a subset of the Democratic Party. Uh, it's very important. Our electoral rules are, are pretty important, as, are, as they are in some countries. In, in some countries, uh, you vote for the party, not the candidate. And, you know, the party has representation in parliament, depending on the percentage of the votes it gets. In that case, a Green Party could get 5 6 percent of the votes and have somebody in Washington. Here, you've got to win a majority to get into the House, to get into the Senate. Uh, it's very tough for third parties of any kind in our system, not in all systems. I wouldn't say we're heavily, we're heavily polarized now. The Republican and Democratic parties used to overlap more. You used to actually have conservative Democrats who were more conservative than liberal Republicans, believe it or not. Um, so one of the reasons for this is um, electoral laws, but it's this is the strongest correlation he's got. And that's between the importance of environmental pressure groups and the strength of policy efforts to preserve the environment, which is sort of interesting. Says the environmental movement does matter. Uh, he called uh, environmental movement pressure. If you think about it in the U.S., we don't actually have a lot of marches and rallies for the environment. We have interest groups in Washington. The Environmental Defense Fund, the Sierra Club, the this, the that. So there are not a lot of non-conventional actions being done to save the environment. There was a time in the Pacific Northwest when people would drive iron spikes into trees to prevent logging. You don't hear much of that anymore. Uh, you don't hear people chaining themselves to uh, nuclear power uh, plants much anymore. So at this point, we're lobbying. Other places stronger. The other interesting correlation is how much stronger the correlation between environmental movement pressure and policy is than between movement pressure and his measure, at least, of changes in the environment. And part of that has to do with where you are and what the natural conditions are, right? Policy efforts in Los Angeles are extraordinary. Los Angeles has dirty air. Uh, I, don't, I don't think there's a European country that takes as much pain to preserve air quality as, they, as is done in the Los Angeles basin. It's just really hard. It just doesn't ventilate. So the notion that, and if you're, if you're highly, uh, if it's a very dense country, it's kind of hard to preserve species against development and so on and so forth. So I don't know, you, you believe the, are you persuaded by the article? Comments on it? Does that actually seem like a plausible description of interest group, of environmental politics. And I, I would notice also that 
the difference, the, 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 the link between, and again, causation uh, is an inference. It's correlation is all we, all we measure. The link between individual, um, between environmental pressure and attitudes isn't that great. Which makes sense in the US, right? Because the Sierra Club isn't trying to persuade you and me. It's trying to persuade Congress and the EPA. So uh, if it's successful there, it wins. Um, individual attitudes and policy, not that strong either. Not that strong a correlation. So this is sort of a picture of uh, lobbying where the environmental movement acts directly on policy, doesn't act indirectly, seems to me, through parades, mass marches, demonstrations, and any of those other mechanisms. I think that's a fair description of the movement now in the US, yeah. To me, it seems pretty reasonable, even though it's correlation, not causation, right? Because uh, although one can make the argument that interest groups would, be, would, be, would come out uh, after a certain policy is made, it seems to me that the, the more logical flow would be for information, infor, uh, for those groups to be formed initially and then the policy is made. Um, so even though he proved only correlation, I think that, that that flow makes more sense. Oh yeah, no, it's not, it's not from, it, 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 so in fact, in fact it can go the other way because when Reagan basically declared war on environmental policy, the memberships of those groups soared because they saw a threat. And the groups, uh, uh, you know, set out mass mailing saying, look what this guy's trying to do to the environment. And the money flowed in. Um, it's not, so the question of are they, are they exerting pressure? Yes, but in that case, they were exerting more pressure in a much more hostile environment politically. So, yeah. Um, I, I think that the direction is generally right. Any other comments? Yeah, Charlotte. I guess, like, I know you had a system for doing all this, but it seems like you could come up with a different system and get different results. And I, I don't know. I You're just not a natural like sociologist. You just. The numbers are weird to apply to this. Yeah, well. But this raises, this raises a sort of a general. A general problem in social science, in economics, we get lucky because you, you, you have dollars and quantities and tons and stuff. This is sociology. What have you got? You've got attitudes. <laughs> You've got some ill-defined measures of this, that, and the other. You want to say, are environmental groups effective? Uh, it seems to me you're stuck doing something like this. You can do it well or poorly. I think this is pretty good. Um, I'm still not, I hadn't thought about it much, but it just didn't strike me that just running ordinary correlations is quite the right way to do it. But there's no obviously better way that comes to mind. I don't know, what would you do? I think I'd be more persuaded by case studies where it did work in the case where there was like a green party or wasn't a green party where it didn't work in that sort of case. Like, I think I'd be more, just, I think I'd be able to relate to that more. And I know that's not as general as what he's trying to do here. Yep. But I think that maybe he makes it too general. Like, what's the difference between like a 0.6 and a 0.7 on his little scale? Like, that doesn't mean anything to me. So. No, I'm, 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 I'm sort of with you. Uh, I, I'd prefer to, I'd prefer to understand one or two cases well than 18 cases badly. Um, the issue is, well, it's a general, it's a general problem, right? Uh, you do a case study. You, you, you have a study where n equals 1, right? You can't test a hypothesis with n equals 1. So if you're interested in testing a hypothesis, say environmental movements operate mainly through individual attitudes. You can't do n equals 1. You could probably do before and after in a case study. You could try it. But of course, you can't hold everything else constant. No, I, I'm, I'm sympathetic. I, I'm, I'm not excited about kind of unidimensional measures of policy efforts, right? I mean, U.S. policy is stronger than some of those other countries on some dimensions and weaker on others. Um, Europe, European tax systems favor use of diesels. Diesels produce small particulates. Small particulates have terrible health effects. 
So are they more environmentally conscious than we are because they recycle or more, or are we more environmentally conscious because we avoid diesels? Very hard to do. Yeah, no, I, I, I take the point. Anybody else? Okay. We will Wednesday uh, talk about uh, U.S. environmental policy, walking through the case study and looking beyond it, so please read that. Um, and for those of you who came late, Monday we will see if we can find a guest speaker for an hour and we'll do an hour's soft shoe on, a half an hour's soft shoe on green growth, uh, reflecting the will of a narrow majority. <laughs>